Greetings. This is Doc Ock coming at you live and direct from Black Facts Headquarters Central here in lovely Kent, Ohio on another wonderful day. That's right. Wonderful, beautiful day. A beautiful day to be alive. Absolutely. So we're going to give you the real deal. We're not going to give you no jive because it's too beautiful a day to be alive to be giving y'all a whole bunch of jive. To start off, you know what to do. First of all, go ahead and give us a like. If you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching on the tube, give us a thumbs up. And if you really like what we're doing, go ahead and spread the word far and wide, coast to coast without a boast. Because, you know, we need somebody to give us a bit of a toast. All right? Appreciate it. Meanwhile, speaking of how uh, being a lovely day, proverb for today is, living is worthless for one without a home. Living is worthless for one without a home. So keep that one in mind. And that one, I, I'm pretty sure that's another Ethiopian proverb. Yep, only because it is. Now, we're going to get black to our book we've been reading from the, as an uh, introduction to Juneteenth. And I understand the book is a bit of a slog. It's kind of slow moving. Doesn't have a lot of action right now. I got all that understandable. I mean, if it's a slog for me, I'm sure it's a slog for you. So uh, just let me be clear that I got that. But what they're talking about here is what led up to John Brown, to the John Brown raid, to the raid on Harper's Ferry, where black and white men took an action that was so bold that it shook the nation to its foundations, where you had ex-slaves, former slaves, free men, escaped slaves, whoever they were, and white men, abolitionists, etc., make an attack on a U.S. armory and successfully take over the armory. So they had the guns. No, they didn't go through a background check. No, they didn't get them at the flea market. No, they didn't get it from their granddaddy. They went and took over an armory where they had a whole wide array of all the kind of weapons that the U.S. government has. Why their raid was not successful, I, God only knows. I don't understand that part. But this is the action they took. And we want to look at, well, what led up to that attack? Because we never hear about that. We just hear that there was a raid. It sounds like they were a bunch of crazies, like the ones we hear shooting up the place, uh, these 12 and 14-year-olds around here shooting up the place all the time. But, in fact, this had been all part of a very a long game. John Brown was playing the long game. He had already gone and freed Kansas, and now he was coming to free the rest of the nation. That's why they call him Osawatomie Brown. So... Let's continue on. So these are the uh, minutes from a convention that they had uh, at the at what the a place they call the farm in Chatham, Canada West, Saturday, May eighth, eighteen and fifty eight. Ten a.m. in the morning, the convention met in pursuance to a call of John Brown and others, and was called to order by Mr. Jackson, on whose motion Mr. William C. Monroe was chosen president. When on motion of Mr. Brown, Mr. J. H. Caggy was elected. Secretary.
Mr. Anderson nominated J.W. Logan for the same office. The nomination was afterwards withdrawn, Mr. Logan not being present and it being announced that he would not serve if elected. Mr. Brown then moved to postpone the election of president for the present. Carried. The convention then went into the election of members of, con of, of Congress. Messrs. A.M. Ellsworth and Osborne Anderson were elected. After which, the convention went into the election of Secretary of State, to which office Richard Rolfe was chosen. Whereupon, the convention adjourned to half past 2 p.m. or 2 and a quarter p.m. Again assembled and went into a balloting for the election of Treasurer and Secretary of the Treasury. Owen Brown was elected as the former and George B. Gill as the latter. The following resolution was then introduced by Mr. Brown and unanimously passed. Resolved that John Brown, J.H. Caggy, Richard Rolfe, L.F. Parsons, C.P. Todd, C. Whipple, C.W. Moffitt, John D. E. Cook, Owen Brown, Stuart Taylor, Osborne Anderson, A.M. Ellsworth, Richard Richardson, W.H. Lehman, and John Lawrence B. and are hereby appointed a committee to whom is delegated the power of the convention to fill by election all the offices specially named in the provisional constitution which may be vacant after the adjournment of this convention. The convention then adjourned. J.H. Caggy, Secretary of the Convention. It sounds like they're setting up a, uh, they're definitely setting up an organization, but it sounds a lot like a government. Names of members of the convention written by each person. William Charles Monroe, president of the convention. G.J. Reynolds, J.C. Grant, A.J. Smith, James M. Jones, George B. Gill, M.F. Bailey, William Lambert, S. Hutton, uh, Hunton, C.W. Moffitt, John J. Jackson, John Anderson, or J. Anderson, Alfred Whipple, James M. Buell, W.H. Lehman, Alfred M. Ellsworth, John E. Cook, Stuart Taylor, James W. Purnell, George Aiken, Stephen Detton, Thomas Hickerson, John Connell, Robinson Alexander, Richard Rolfe, Thomas F. Carey, Richard Richardson, L. F. Parsons, Thomas M. Kennard, Martin R. Delaney, Robert Van Vanken, Thomas M. Stringer, Charles P. Tidd, John A. Thomas, C. Whipple, I. D. Shad, Robert Newman, Owen Brown, John Brown, J. H. Harris, Charles Smith, Simon Fizzlin, Isaac Holler, James Smith, J. H. Caggy, Secretary of the Convention. So you can see there weren't that many people that were at this convention. It looks like a list of about 20 people. But the work was going on bravely. Uh, those commissions, John H. Caggy, A Little Cloud, Judas, uh, Judas Forbes, etc. Many affect to despise the so-called Chatham Convention. And the persons... And the persons who were there abetted the treason, quote unquote treason. Governor Wise would like nothing better than to engage the candidates with but 10 men under his command. By that, it is clear that the men acquainted with Brown's plans would not be a breakfast spell for the chivalrous Virginian. 
in one respect, they were not formidable, and their constitution would seem to be a harmless piece of paper. Some of them were outlaws against Buchanan democratic rule in the territories. Some were colored men who had felt severely the prescriptive spirit of American caste. Others were escaped slaves who had left dear kindred behind, writhing in the bloody grasp of the vile man-stealer, never, never to be released until some practical daring determined step should be taken by their friends or their escaped brethren. What use could such men make of a constitution? Destitute of political or social power as respects the American states and people, what ghost of an echo could they invoke by declamation or action against the peculiar institution? In the light of slaveholding logic and its conclusions, they were but renegade whites and insolent blacks. But, aggregating their grievances, summing up their deep-seated hostility to a system to which every precept of morality, every tie of relationship is a perpetual protest. The men in convention and the many who could not conveniently attend at that time were not a handful to be despised. The braggadocio of the Virginia governor might be eager to, the, to engage them with 10 slaveholders, but John Brown was satisfied with them, and that is honor enough for a generation. After the convention adjourned, other business was dispatched with utmost speed, and everyone seemed in good spirits. The boys, quote-unquote, of the party of, quote-unquote, surveyors, as they were called, were admired of those who knew them and the subject of curious remark and inquiry by strangers. So many intellectual-looking men are seldom seen in one party, and at the same time, such utter disregard of prevailing custom or style in dress and other little conventionalities. Hour after hour, they would sit in council, thoughtful, ready, some of them eloquent, all fearless, patient of the fatigues of business. Anon, here and there, over the quote-unquote track, and again in the assembly, when the time for relaxation came, sallying forth arm in arm, unshaven, unshorn, and altogether indifferent about it, or one, it may be, impressed with the coming responsibility, sauntering alone, in earnest thought, apparently indifferent to all outward objects, but ready at a word or sign from the chief to undertake any task. During the sojourn at Chatham, the commissions to the men were discussed, etc. It has been a matter of inquiry, even among friends, why colored men were not commissioned by John Brown to act as captains, lieutenants, etc. I reply with the knowledge that men in the movement now living will confirm it that John Brown did offer the captaincy and other military positions to colored men equally with others, but a want of acquaintance with military tactics was the invariable excuse. Holding a civil position, as we termed it, I declined a captain's commission tendered by the brave old man as better suited to those more experienced. And as I was willing to give my life to the cause, trusting to experience and fidelity to make me more worthy, my excuse was accepted. The same must be said of other colored men to be spoken of hereafter and who proved their worthiness by their able defense of freedom at the ferry. So in other words, he's saying that a lot of people question why there weren't more uh, more black men were not made leaders, uh, military leaders of John Brown's little group. And that basically many of them, these, um, um, these black men, felt 
Others may be better equipped, but more experienced. And so they let them take that position and they did what they could do. In other words, they got in, they, they had to get in where they could fit in and they didn't feel like they fit in there, basically, in a nutshell. So uh, that's a very interesting point because a lot of times that charge gets thrown around about Black History Month, that Black History Month was something that was given to us. Like somebody gave us Black History Month as a birthday present or something, when in fact we selected that month. We decided we wanted to have Black History Month in February. It wasn't that somebody gave it to us. So it is the shortest month of the year. We understand that. But it wasn't that somebody else gave it to us and they shortchanged us by giving us the shortest day of the month. We decided that's when we wanted to have Black History Month. End of discussion. So we're going to move on before we start doing some cussing. And in the meanwhile, we need you all to do a few things for us as well, such as if you're watching on Facebook, give us a like. If you're watching on YouTube, give us a thumbs up. And then take the plunge. Take that one more step as uh, others have done earlier this week and become a sustaining member of the Black Facts family. How do you do that? You can send a check. You can send a money order. You can pay um, online. If you want to send a check or a money order, that the address it to Black Facts, B-L-A-K-F-A-C-T-S. You can put that on the check or the money order too because we can take that to the bank. Um, and the address is 437 Silver Meadows Boulevard, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Your support will be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and log on out here. We'll be black tonight with more uh, tales of Juneteenth. So 9 o'clock, look for us here because we're about to rock. This is Doc Ock at noon and 9, signing off. Peace out without a doubt. And I see you over there, Brother Maurice. Good to see you today. We're going to go ahead and transition on out with our theme song. Boom. We got that long song we love to play. Let's see if we can hit it. Hit it a lick one time right now. <laughs> 